Coming up on the Human Spark. Welcome to my brain. Okay, Alan, we can see that you have a brain. Come inside my head as we search for what makes humans unique. We explore the role of language and symbols, our skill with tools, relating to others. Who do you like? Even a puppet. That one. And imagining tomorrow. You're watching us plan for the future when we don't even know we are. I'm now going to pick up the human brain. <laughs> Welcome to my brain. The product of three and a half billion years of evolution and a few decades of living. It weighs only three pounds, but it's arguably the most complicated thing in the known universe. Along, of course, with almost seven billion other human brains, including yours, inhabiting the skulls of people all around the planet. In there somewhere, all my thoughts, all my memories, all my prejudices, my ambitions, my knowledge, my loves, the words I'm speaking, just milliseconds before they come out of my mouth. But while all of our brains are unique, they all have something in common. They all possess the human spark, the something that makes them different from anything else that those three and a half billion years of evolution have created. And it's new, this, this thing, this spark. Our ancestors got along quite well without it for millions of years. We've been tracing the origins and nature of the human spark, and in the next hour, we're going to try to locate it there. There. Does it lie in our unique facility with language, in our skill with tools, our ability to figure out what others are thinking and then to try to outthink them, in our reliving our pasts and anticipating our futures? Or does the human spark reside deep within our private thoughts, what our mind is doing when it seems we're doing nothing at all. So come inside my head. Let's see what we can find. Here's a human brain, happily not mine, wrinkled and beige and dense and unassuming as it's laid out on a bench at Emory University in Atlanta. They have a lot of brains here, preserved for research. This is from a chimpanzee, a little less wrinkled and perhaps a third the size of the human brain, but otherwise not looking much different. Next in line is the brain from a monkey, even smaller but still familiar in shape. Finally, the brain of a rat. Until very recently, science knew much more about the brains of the rat and monkey than those of the chimp or ourselves. How much can you tell about the, the difference between us by just by looking at the brain? Not very much. Every little bit of cortex is, is, is like a very, very sophisticated bit of wiring or a very sophisticated bit of computer circuitry. And, you know, what we'd like to know is, is are those circuits the same or are they different? And, and if so, in what ways are they different? And how does that relate to differences in the way we think and act? It's not enough to look at the surface features of the brain. You've got to go inside. So and so I've spent several hours over the last few months in brain scanning machines like this one here at MIT. MRI machines employ a powerful magnetic field to image the brain. And they can also find out what parts of my brain are active when I'm doing different tasks. It's in my brain somewhere. But first, as always with these brain scanning sessions, they're going to start with the basics. Okay, Alan, we can see that you have a brain and we're ready to do the first scan. For this one, all you need to do is lay back and relax. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, here goes. This will last for about four minutes. The MRI takes slices across my brain from side to side, top to bottom, and front to back. Randy Buckner seems happy with what he sees. What looks good about my brain? Well, there's a lot of changes we see as we age, and, and these happen in all of us. Even yeah. by the time we're 30, our brains are different than we were, we were 18. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I look at your brain, actually, I should say, it's quite, it really is remarkable. Yeah. You, 
And some of the things we're seeing, we always see that these fluid-filled spaces right here, this yeah. dark area, that's fluid, and those spaces exist in all of us. As we age, they tend to grow. Yours haven't grown that much. This looks like a brain, if I had a guess, I would have guessed you're a 40 or 50. So far, so good. The slices taken in the MRI will now be combined to give a complete three-dimensional image of my whole head, brain included. It's in this virtual brain of mine that we'll be looking for signs of my human spark. Uh oh. But we're going to begin by looking for the spark in some much younger brains. I'm visiting a lab at Harvard University that conducts ingenious experiments to find out what children know and what they don't. And right away, I'm in for a surprise. We're trying to figure out the human spark, you know, what makes us human. Mm -hmm. And we certainly do seem to be very different from the other animals. To say the least. Yeah. yeah. So are we born with something that right off the bat it makes us vastly different? I don't think so. No? This is a question that I've been trying to answer for the last 30 years or so. And for most of that time, my hunch was that we were, that we would see in infants systems of knowledge that human infants alone would display. But when we look hard at what a four-month-old or a six-month-old infant can do, we see very close similarities between the capacities of human infants and the capacities of infants and adults of other species. So I don't think that that human spark ignites uh, early in development. Well, what, what would bring it about? What, why, I mean, do, are we very reliant on this culture that we have? I think that's a great question and one that's very debated right now. My personal view is that uh, what's most central to the sparking of uniquely human cognitive capacities mm -hmm. is our capacity for language. And that it's when children really get going on the task of learning language, uh, learning their first words at nine or ten months of age, putting words together uh, a few months later, that's when we start seeing these uniquely human capacities emerging. So Liz Spelke sees language as igniting the human spark. She's exploring that idea by studying how language allows children to interpret maps as representing the real world. So you take a two-and-a-half-year-old child and show them a two-dimensional drawing that simply has a simple geometric figure on it, say a triangle, and say to them, Nora, guess what? Kermit, he has a favorite bucket that he likes to sit in. There is one bucket that he likes the best. And today, we are going to put him in his favorite bucket, okay? Here's our picture of the room. There's one bucket, there's another bucket, and there's another bucket. Kermit, which one is your favorite bucket? My favorite is this one right here. Oh, Kermit says that this one is his favorite. Nora, can you put Kermit in his favorite bucket? Yay! That's a remarkable yeah. ability. But if you ask, what have you done with this child to engage this ability, to engage this symbolic function? You've talked to them. You've told them. There's one bucket, there's another bucket, and there's another bucket. And that raised the question, what if you didn't do that? What if you simply showed them the piece of paper and said, there's one, and there's another, and there's another. Now, Kermit, which is your favorite one? My favorite one is this one right here. Oh. Notice that unlike Nora, Xander isn't told that the spot on the map represents a bucket. Can you put him in his favorite bucket? Yay! Good job. You got him on the picture. We want to get Kermit in his favorite bucket in the room. Which is Kermit's favorite bucket? Without the cue of language, Xander wasn't able to relate the map to the real world. But when he's prompted... I'm going to give him to you. And they have this ability, you think, because they're already manipulating symbols in language. Exactly. Exactly. And as far as I can see, that ability develops spontaneously in us by virtue of being human. It doesn't develop at birth. We don't see it um, uh, until children are about nine or ten months of age. Uh, but as far as I can see, that's an innate uniquely human capacity that emerges in children toward the end of the first year. For Liz Spelke, the key to both human language and the human spark 
is the ability to manipulate symbols in our minds. An innate ability, but one that doesn't kick in until we're almost a year old. To find out just how our language skills develop in childhood, I've come here to the University of Oregon. Do you think you can figure out what there is about us that enables us to talk to one another? The first thing that you learn as a child is just the sounds. Babble, babble, make sounds. And then at about a year, they start learning that words stand for objects in the world. Usually nouns is what they start with. So they'll say ball, cat. And then later they'll get some verbs, eat. And then only at about a year and a half will they start making little sentences, put two words together, like mummy, up. I have a grandson, oh. and he, whose, his first two-word sentence was, eat out. <laughs> Helen is figuring out how we get from sounds to sentences with the aid of what must be the world's most attractive headgear. That is a lovely hat. You know, the I... color I, really suits you. I don't know why these never caught on. And... <laughs> Let me ask you about the difference between us and other animals. If I, if I say to um, a well-trained dog, get me the bone, he, he's liable to be able to do it. But if I say to him, get me the bone that's behind the door, he might have trouble with that, right? Because it's, he's, there, there are too many ins and outs in that, in yeah. that sentence. Is that a big difference between us, or, or, or is that bridgeable with other animals? I think just about everybody agrees that's the main difference between um, human communication or human language and other animal communication systems. Is that other animals can have ob you know, visual symbols or even sound symbols, can stand for particular objects in the world. That's right, like my dog knows the meaning of several words. Car, we're going in the car. Mm. Or bone, cookie, you want a cookie? Cookie, yeah. I, um, I know all these too. But you know, right? <laughs> so good. far, I'm off right up with you're your good. dog there, yeah. But, but when does the dog have trouble? Well, if you were to say, um, I want you to get the cookie that is followed by the car. Mm versus um, or the cookie that's the cookie in the car that's in the car yeah he'd say he'd think we're gonna go for a ride and, right and where's my cookie <laughs> yeah it's all good all good it's all good you know, and all, the, yes right that's right so that's the main difference between human language and animal communication systems is grammar I think everybody agrees about that so just have a seat we have a pillow for the small so grammar is what makes human language critical to igniting the human spark which is where my new hat comes in okay so it's an electric chair. <laughs> it's going to be checking out my grammatical skills while I watch a video. I just have to watch it, and, mm -hmm. and my, these electrodes are picking up uh, yeah. what I'm yeah. thinking. Yeah, we see a brain reaction within 100 milliseconds, uh, whether you're doing a task or not, actually. The video's narration sometimes makes sense. A baby penguin swings on that door. The baby And sometimes the it doesn't. The truck goes up and down in the papers over hills. The electrodes are recording where and when my brain reacts to these mistakes. When the mistake is simply a word that doesn't make sense, Pinga turns up the penguin really loud. An area in the back of my brain, mostly on the left, reacts within two tenths of a second. But when the mistake is grammatical, the concert are starting. My brain pounces on the error within one tenth of a second and this time in a region toward the front and exclusively on the left. Following me into the video booth and equipped with a much more fetching hat is six-year-old Danica. Wood into that black stove. When there's a mistake of meaning, Pinga claps her ball happily. Her brain, just like mine, reacts in two-tenths of a second. But when the video says something grammatically incorrect, the pancake falls onto there his head. Her brain is slower to respond than mine. And the response isn't so focused over that area in the front left. In fact, Helen Neville argues, it takes perhaps 10 or 15 years for the brain to organize itself to process grammar swiftly and efficiently in just one focused, specialized region. It looks, for example, like that's an important area for sequencing different kinds of information. And of course, sequencing is an important part of language. It looks like Areas just behind there are very important for tool use in the left side as tool well. Tool use. Tool use, yeah. 
Tool so, use over, over where language is taking place. Actually, it's possible that one aspect of language is closely tied to tool use, especially this kind of um, action planning and sequencing that we have to do in order to talk. Now this is a fascinating take on the human spark, that two of the most defining attributes of what make us human, language and the making and using of tools, should somehow be tied together in our brains. What makes it even more fascinating is that I'd heard this idea before in a very different context. Good? Yeah, you're getting the hang of this. While searching for the first glimmerings of the spark in our ancestors, I had joined a class in Stone Age technology run by John Shea at Stony Brook University. I was able to put a pretty effective cutting edge on a piece of rock. Very sharp. Very sharp, yeah. But a key moment in human evolution, a moment many anthropologists believe the human spark first ignited, is when humans went from making simple stone tools to combining smaller, finer stone points with other materials to make spears and arrows. It's possible that you know, the combination of different elements is paralleling linguistic structure, where, where meaning comes from recombining different elements in different orders. Mm -hmm. And just as there is only one proper, uh, a limited number of proper ways to, for me to say the sentence I'm saying right now, there's only a few proper and effective ways to combine these elements of stone and, and, and string and wood. Mm -hmm. And if you do it the wrong way, you're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Natural selection, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And then once you lay down, just... Um, to find out how closely language and tool use are linked in my brain, it's time for me to go back into the MRI machine. I'm at the University of Oregon again, where a research team is trying to find out why humans are so naturally adept at using tools. Doing all right so far? Yeah. Very good. So I'm going to give you the gripper in your right hand now. The plan is for me to use a tool, or actually to imagine I'm using a tool, to perform a task I'd learned just a couple of hours before. We're going to do multiple trials with your hand right now. There you go. First, I'd had to grasp this knob with my thumb and forefinger. The idea was to see whether my thumb went to the tan side or the pink side. <laughs> and now we're going to have you do the same thing with this tool. And at first, it's going to seem a little odd. Yeah. But we're going to call this end of the tool that's marked with blue the thumb of the tool. This, this is the thumb. That's yeah. right. Okay. I'm not trying to imitate what I no. did before. I'm just trying no. to make it easy Whatever to do with the tool. Whatever's most comfortable. That's right. So yeah. choose the grip that's most comfortable. Scott Fry there believes that when we use a tool, our brains quickly start treating it as an extension of our own bodies. I mean, because this is actually modifying the mechanics of your arm, right. so it may be now be more awkward to do what you did right. before. Yeah, it would be, yeah. I feel a little more comfortable now doing this a few times. I don't have to decide what to do. I can kind of do it more intuitively. Once I've got used to the task, it's off to the scanner. Okay, Alan, now the fun begins. We're going to scan your brain while you're making judgments about how to grasp those objects with your hand or with that new tool that you learned how to use earlier. And we're going to be looking to see where those patterns of activity are. Because my upper body is not supposed to move in the scanner, I'm pressing foot pedals to signal which side of the knob I would grasp with my real thumb or the gripper thumb. And even though in each case my arm and hand would actually move very differently, the areas of my brain that light up are the same. While using the tool, my brain treats it as an extension of my body, and it's actively planning the muscle movements that manipulating the tool requires. All this tool use planning is going on in the left side of my brain, and very close to the areas we use for language. The fact that they're so close together, the speech production and, and, uh, and so much of the planning up over here, mm -hmm. uh, is that, is that significant, do you think? I it, mean, it, it could would... reflect the fact that there are some, some common underlying processes. So, for uh -huh. example, a candidate I would suggest, at least worth considering, is this ability to adjust a behavior that's happening right now in anticipation of a goal we want to achieve in the future. For example, if you were to say the word tulip versus the word uh, ticket, Watch what your lips do when you say tulip. You start tulip. to anticipatorily round your lips and yeah. during the T in anticipation of the vowel coming uh, behind it. Yeah. Watch what you do when you say the same 
uh, consonant, T, in the word ticket. Tulip, ticket. Tulip, ticket. I'm starting to make way for the ooh in tulip, when, with, when, even as I'm saying the T. But in ticket, I don't do it. I, I, I'm, I'm already here with tulip, but I'm, yeah, I see. You do something a little bit different. So, so that's a clue that there's some kind of planning going You're on. You're planning ahead. And in language. And, and when chimps say tulip, they don't do that? <laughs> they, as far as we know. <laughs> Chimps and some other animals do use tools, of course, but just as grammar and the complexity of meaning it allows makes human speech different from animal communication, in the same way it's the complexity of our tools that sets human tool use apart. My guess is that we could be getting very close to a key element of the human spark. So I've come to London to meet a researcher working with a family with a rare genetic mutation. A mutation that appears to inhibit the ability to make the very precise sequencing of fine muscle movements needed for both tool use and speech. How would you describe the, the impediment that he has? Well, he has difficulty enunciating his words. So it's very difficult for someone who's not present and is listening to what he's saying to understand the words that he's repeating. Squash. The problem becomes much more obvious when they're spontaneously generating sentences. There's a question of sequencing here. The brain's not able to very sequence Very much as so, well. because um, the circuitry that seems to be affected by this genetic mutation is the circuitry that's specialized for sequencing for timing, for generating. So all of these abilities that are incorporated into the production of fluent and articulate speech. When you speak, you don't plan what you're going to say. If you were going to plan everything that you were going to say, we'd be sitting here for a long time <laughs> trying to have a conversation. You have an idea in your mind and somehow it's uh, I hate to use the word magic, but it really is like magic because this thought maps on to a stream of utterance mm. that comes out perfectly coherent in the right order and it's actually timed perfectly in milliseconds. Right. It's, you know, sometimes there's a sense of a general urge, um, a very um, incoherent urge to express some kind of thought. And then all of a sudden, it these comes, words yeah. come out. And sometimes we say it in whole sentences and real paragraphs. That's right. And it's, it's amazing how the thinking process is occurring during the spoken speech. Exactly. Now, these people, this family, is, uh, is somehow impeded in that process. Exactly. Accept. Tracking down the source of the impediment meant tracking down the gene that's defective in the family. The great hope was that here might be a language gene, even the language gene, surely providing a wonderful insight into the human spark. The gene was identified here in the Oxford University lab of Simon Fisher. Here, because this binding is so strong, and if you look at the consensus yeah. over here, it's it's. It's much called weaker. Fox P2, but the gene has nothing to do with foxes. Fox P2. It's no Although it did turn out to be present in many other creatures, from mice to fish. You might think that a gene that's involved in speech and language might be unique to humans, but in fact this gene is surprisingly similar in lots of different species. Similar but not identical. The human form of the gene is a little different from the FOXP2 gene in chimpanzees, for instance, and even more different from the FOXP2 gene in mice, at least in most mice. These particular mice have been given the human FOXP2 gene in an ambitious experiment aimed at finding out what exactly the human form of the gene is capable of. I've come to the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany to meet the man behind the mice, Svante Pabo. The first question is how do you analyze a, a mouse for speech? So we tried to speak to it a lot and it never answered. <laughs> so we had a big problem. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you weren't saying the right thing. That could be. What's the second difference? So the second, just 
knocked us off our feet. They do <laughs> vocalize differently. They do? Yes. Whoa. There's of course no way to say if they vocalize in a more human-like way, but it's different. Male mice make high-pitched squeaks when they're around females, too high for the human ear. But their pitch can be altered in the computer so the trained ear can hear them. Compared to normal mice, the mice with the human gene squeak at a slightly lower pitch. This is clearly not that those mice can speak, but what it means that the human form somehow impacts the neural circuits maybe that are involved in speech production. My sense from, from the FOXP2 story is that FOXP2 was around for a long time doing uh, interesting things in the brains of our ancestors and um, it was in the right place, if you like, to be recruited towards speech and language. This makes evolutionary sense given that our fox P2 is not the same as the chimp and mouse versions of the gene. In fact, the chimp fox P2 is actually more similar to the version found in mice than it is to the one we humans have. This suggests that while FOXP2 may not be the language gene, it is one of the few genes scientists have identified that contribute to abilities that we have and chimpanzees lack. Scientists will undoubtedly find others, but in the meantime, there is another much more obvious difference between chimps and us. I'm now gonna pick up the human brain. <laughs> the single most notable thing about the human brain is its sheer size much bigger in proportion to our bodies than that of almost any other creature. Three or four times bigger than a chimp's brain, for instance, which itself is unusually large. The question of why our brains became so big is one that will drive much of the agenda for the rest of our search for the human spark. It's a question that has long fascinated Oxford University's Robin Dunbar. The traditional story has always been making tools and hunting, you know, mm. this kind of technological expertise. Yeah. I don't think that's right. I think it's social skills. And this goes back to the general view as to why primates have bigger brains than all other species of, of animals. That it's to do with the complexity of the societies they live in. So they're just socially much smarter, if you like. Their whole evolutionary strategy has been to solve problems socially, communally. So in effect, they live in a kind of implicit social contract, if you like. They, they kind of collaborate with each other uh, in order to solve the problems of everyday life and death. So the, the logic of the argument is you've got an ecological problem out there that you have to solve. Uh, you solve that by having a group. In order to live in a big group, you have to have a brain with sufficient computing power to handle all the relationships. A chimpanzee has to keep track of about 50 individuals, the typical group size in the wild. Robin Dunbar argues that humans, by contrast, can comfortably handle about 150 relationships. It's very roughly the number of people you know as persons, as individuals. So mm -hmm. you know enough about them that you know where they fit into your social world, you know where you fit into their social mm -hmm. world, you know... Uh, that if you ask them a favor, they would kind of grumble, but they would probably say, mm. OK. Robin notes that the threefold increase in group size from 50 in chimps to 150 in humans fits nicely with the three times bigger brains we humans possess. To find out just how skilled those big human brains are at sorting out our social relationships, I've come to Yale University, where the brains we'll be meeting are only a few months old. Hello, Jessica. Oh, I can't wait Hello, a nice dress. <laughs> very nice. And a bow in your hair. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. Jessica, nine months old, gets to watch a puppet show. Okay, here we go. While the striped puppet seems to want to play ball, Green Jacket is having none of it. Here we go. Orange Jacket, on the other hand, is happy to join in. Hi. See? Hi. Hi. Who do you like? 
That oh, one. Oh. Good job. That was the nice bunny. <laughs> that was really good. Good job. In many similar experiments with babies only a few months old, the infants almost always choose the cooperating puppet. One thing that's clearly true of the human species is that we're a profoundly cooperative social species, mm -hmm. where cooperation is necessary uh, to survival and where mutual cooperation is required and the ability to detect mutual cooperators and also to detect those who are not cooperating is essential. And here you see it's, it's happening at this very early age. She's giving Indeed me such it a is. look. She, she had You're no trouble. You're trying to figure out if I'm nice or I'm the other <laughs> rabbit, right? Remarkably, the ability to discriminate between nice and mean extends even to objects that have very little other than a pair of eyes to suggest that they're beings with minds and intentions. The yellow triangle pushes the red circle back down the hill watched by six-month-old Nora. The blue square, on the other hand, gives a helpful boost. Hey, little girl. Which one do you like? That one. Good job. Yeah, that was the nice To one. Nora, possessor of the human spark, it's perfectly natural to see intent, yeah, both good and bad, one? in simple wooden yeah. shapes. That's a good one. So how often does the baby choose the helper? Almost 100% of the time. Really? Yeah. Oh, this one. <laughs> <laughs> Your work is similar to intersex Karen's a little bit, right? We, we work together on different projects. Um, I'm very interested in the role of uh, social understanding and social cognition. This reading of intent, even into inanimate objects, fascinates Karen Wynn's husband and fellow Yale right. professor, Paul oh, Bloom. Okay. Of our projects, we do collaborative work. He argues that it explains another characteristic of the human spark, one shared by all human societies. I think we're natural conspiracy theorists. So the way we work is whenever we see things in the physical world, we try to attribute to them some sort of psychological intentional cause. So one, one example of this is animism. Um, people all around, when they see the movement of clouds or the rustle of the trees, will attribute an intentional thinking being behind it. And that's where you get gods and ghosts and spirits. Um, another manifestation of it is when we see things in the world, like biological things, like, like trees or animals, we tend to assume somebody built them. We can't help but look at the rest of nature that way. Is that what you're saying? That we, we ascribe to nature what we, what we see in one another? That's exactly right. We're trigger happy. We're <laughs> hypersensitive. And look, it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. If you're going to threaten me, if you have some malevolent intention or even some good intention, I'm really going to keep an eye out for that. Now, the cost for me always keeping an eye out is sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I overshoot. Sometimes I say, hey, what's happening with the trees? What's happening with the wind? OK, that's a cost. But the benefit of noticing it when it's there is extremely powerful. So in Nora's already finely honed instinct for seeing good and bad intentions, even in pieces of wood, may lie the biological origins of the belief in almost every human culture in a god or gods. We've evolved to see intention everywhere. You've got a really good grip. I like my finger back now. But the babies who visit Karen Wynn's lab at Yale not only see intention in puppets, they also prefer puppets who have similar tastes, literally. Eric is given a choice of two foods. One dish contains some rather slimy and unappetizing green beans. Perhaps not the best way to get him to eat his vegetables. Like most of the kids given the choice, Eric chooses the crackers. A wise choice. Mmm, <laughs> yum. I like graham crackers. Two puppets then get to sample the dishes. Ew, yuck. I don't like green beans. Hi. Mmm, yum. I like green beans. Hi. Ew, yuck. I don't like graham crackers. Look. When given a choice of which puppet to play with, Eric, like nearly all the babies tested, chooses the one that likes the same food he does. Is that the one that likes the graham crackers, huh? Do you think that this ability to, to spot who's like us and prefer them mm -hmm. 
had anything to do with our becoming what we are now? I think out of all the things that we have studied in our baby lab, this may be one of the ones that is most uniquely human. Uh, certainly the ability to spot in these kind of abstract ways, who has a similar preference? Not even who looks like us. It's, I think, a, an indication of how strong and profound an instinct it is, if you will, to affiliate with others who are similar to ourselves. At every point in development, we're sort of s splitting the world into people who are our allies and people who are our enemies. Mm -hmm. And it may later on be based on race, it may be based on sex, um, it may be based on food preferences and what somebody's done in the past. But we're always choosing who to interact with and who not to. Yeah. And it also ties into religion. So, so one of the features of religions are it, it's a group of people who have the, these ties together. They work for one another, they worship a common God, they might eat the same food, they might wear the same clothing, and they're united in a very strong and powerful way. Now unfortunately, you don't get that unity without a cost. The cost is they're united against the people who live over there or who practice these other beliefs. The babies in Karen Wynn's lab are exhibiting two of the most potent signatures of the human spark. Our determination to see meaning and intention in everything around us, and an inclination to bond with others who are like us. Going back to Paul's example, these two human drives are most vividly displayed in the power of religion. While differing widely in form, all religions have at their core a belief in a higher power, a god or gods who created us, where everything is as it is for a purpose. All religions also have their own elaborate rituals and rules, and in many cases, symbols and costumes that give their adherents a sense of identity. Often these rituals involve singing and dancing, activities with a power of their own. extraordinary sense of uplift that you get out of that experience when you're doing it as a group it creates this sort of sense of community. So it's all part of creating this sense of belonging. The big problem for religion, if you like, is that once you get religion on a big scale, the marriage of church and state in effect, the mechanisms of religion are so powerful creating this sense of community that it can be exploited then mm -hmm. to provide a, a kind of you know, sort of massive militaristic sort of coherence and off you go on your crusades or off you go on, you know, sort of set the world to rights as it were. While religion can lead to holy wars, it's also responsible for much of the art, music and architecture that humans have created, as well as Oxford University and many of the world's other great centers of learning. Robin Dunbar believes that at the bright center of the human spark is a powerful sense of community that comes from our ability to relate to and empathize with others. This ability revolves around the special meaning of the word intentionality. The word intentionality yep. is, is used a lot. It sounds like it's in a very special way. What, what do you mean by intentionality? Well, the term comes really from the philosophy of mind, is the, the ability to kind of uh, understand or, or believe things about the world. So any of these mind state things that you can reflect on, I believe, I think, I mm. worry about the weather and all this kind of stuff. So the question is, you know, can you imagine what other people are also thinking in these mm. kind of ways? So I wonder what you're thinking about now. That's mm -hmm. a sort of double intentionality because I'm in an intentional state and I'm imagining your intentional state too. And if I'm thinking about that lady over there, I'm wondering what, what she's, she's think thinking. Mm -hmm. That's and, and you might be wondering what I'm thinking, what she's thinking. Okay, then yeah, now you're in third order intentionality. Uh -huh. So in principle, this is an infinite sequence. Yes. And the kind of where it starts to bite here is that as far as we know, with a possibly a few exceptions. Almost all species of birds and mammals operate in what's called first order intentionality. So they, they know the contents of their own minds, right? They think that things are the case. I think I, I'll have a worm. Yeah, yeah, I believe there's a worm out there. Yes, I'll go and get it, <laughs> yes. right? 
the, the doubtful cases become kind of things like the great apes. There's yeah. reasonable evidence, I think, that, that mm. they can manage second order intentionality. Mm. So they can understand your mind states. Yeah. Not very well, but they can kind of do it. Uh-huh. Now, the key is that's a big Rubicon for children at about the age of five. Children mm. go through that stage. It's the developmental psychologists call it the theory of mind, acquiring mm. theory of mind. They have a theory about the mind, as it were. But adult humans can run through to fifth order. It starts mm. to get pretty complicated then. I think that you suppose that Jim wants Ella to uh, wonder whether Pete is uh, up to no good. Um, you know, that's pretty heavy computationally. Why doesn't it go on to infinity with us? Simply because it's computationally very demanding. We can actually show that now, that... Mm. Uh, as you go up through these orders, the brain is actually having to work much harder, as this comes out of neuroimaging experiments, uh, to handle these high, higher levels. So it's a purely a kind of, you know, machine constraint. Okay, here goes. This will last for about four minutes. So here I am in the brain scanner at MIT to see how hard the machinery in my brain has to work to figure out another person's thoughts. Actually, not so much how hard my brain's working, but what part of it I'm using. Running the experiment is MIT's Rebecca Sachs and a colleague from Harvard, Randy Buckner. My task is to watch a video of a dog hiding while a girl goes out of the room, then to figure out where she'll look for the dog when she comes back. When I'm thinking about where the dog is, one part of my brain lights up. But to predict where she'll look... I have to think not about where the dog actually is, but about where she thinks it is. There it goes, I got it right. So now, does some, does some other part of my brain light up when I think that other thought, exactly. oh wait, she didn't see it, exactly. she doesn't know. So when you're paying attention, not just to reality, not just where the dog really is, but to her thoughts, to where yeah. she thinks the dog is, then a different part of your brain is, is being used. And so that's what we have a picture of here. This part of the brain is called the right temporoparietal junction, or RTPJ for short. And that's the part of the brain we normally see when people are thinking about other people's thoughts. This is like over here? Exactly, yeah. So sitting just above my right ear is a patch on the surface of my brain that allows me to see into other people's minds, or at least wonder about what they're thinking. Is it any kind of thoughts, or is it just me trying to think about the thoughts of another person? It's just when you're thinking about somebody else's thoughts. Ah. Amazing, huh? It's really amazing. Do you have any ideas? How does this fit into this question we keep asking of what makes us human? Is there something uniquely human about this? Must be, right? Other animals we don't think do this. There's a couple of hints that that might be the case. This is one of a very small number of cortical regions that are the most different in human brains Mm. compared to other brains. And then you can also ask, how does it develop over a child's lifetime? Because one thing you often find is that things that develop later in an individual child's lifetime are also the things that have emerged more recently in evolutionary time. And so again, what we find is this is one of only a few cortical regions that takes a really long time to reach maturity in the life of an individual human child. But that patch on the outside of our brains isn't the only region that gets to work when we're thinking about other people. There are also regions deep in the middle of our brains. If you're thinking about what other people look like or how they feel today or where they come from, what religion they are, how they grew up, anything about another person, you'll get these brain regions recruited. Although I didn't know it at the time, these deep interior regions of my brain are also home to some other unique and unexpected abilities, as I was about to find out from Rebecca's colleague, Randy Buckner. What you're going to do is you're going to see words, and I simply want you to classify them. Now, in between when you're seeing those words, there's going to be a little fixation crosshair on the screen. I want you to stare at that. You don't have to do anything. What I want you to do is just stare at that little crosshair. Okay, here we go. As is often the case with these brain scanning experiments, what I was told was the task really wasn't. It turns out that Randy was actually studying my brain when I was just staring blankly at the little crosshair, with my thoughts turning to random musings. And perhaps the most startling discovery we've made yet about my brain, during these moments of apparently doing nothing, it's actually anything but idle. 
What we think is that humans have adapted the ability to use all these idle moments when we're just left uh, to think to ourselves and muse, to use them to prepare for the future. And so one difference between humans and other animals is that other animals like us are very good at surviving the moment, taking in information and thinking about what to do right then. What humans are extraordinary at doing is thinking about the next moments, what might happen in the future, to be prepared for all those things that happen next. Is that related to why I'll get interesting ideas about something I'm working on when I'm driving a car or in the shower or thinking I'm, I'm just doing some other activity and all of a sudden this stuff will pop into my head. Is that related to what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying, is you're using those idle moments when you don't have to spend that much of your, of your brain power to think about the road. You drift off. You think about worlds that are far from the ones you're experiencing. You think about uh, what might be, and that's one reason we think humans are so creative and so flexible, is we can use all this downtime to, to uh, think about things that have never been done before. And here's the biggest surprise. The regions that fire up in this downtime when my thoughts are wandering seem to be similar to the regions that Rebecca's research shows I use when I'm thinking about other people. It looks to me like it's a similar area of the brain. Is, is it? Yeah, many of the regions overlap, and actually, uh, this is a, a fun thing as a scientist. We are going about our business studying these areas that are involved when we think to ourselves. And uh, uh, Rebecca came one day and, and talked to me about her work, and we had converged completely on, on common areas of the brain that were used uh, when we think of, to ourselves, think about the future, but also when we adapt them for these social scenarios where we think about other people's thoughts. And we find that quite remarkable. You're watching us plan for the future when we don't even know we are. Now that's what we that's think we're really seeing. That's really interesting. Yeah. We think we're seeing the idle brain not being so idle. Yeah. Is this really important about what makes us human? Uh, we absolutely think it is. Even the ability to think about the future makes you want to plan for the future, makes you want to build societies to teach your children because you predict and you expect them to go on. And that ability to, as some people have said, mentally time travel, to think about all these different uh, possibilities is what propels us as a society. Here it seems to me we've come very close to the essential human spark. Delightfully, it's centered in brain regions that are most active when we're apparently doing nothing but are in fact living vividly in our imagination. Every minute that you're not busy doing something in the present, yeah. you've got to be somewhere else right. in time. Yeah. And it's right. the past or the future. Yeah. When the present gets difficult, when it's demanding, when it's interesting, when it's unexpected, yeah. our mind comes immediately to it. But most of the time, most of us are doing pretty routine things that don't require as much of our conscious attention as you might expect. And in those moments, the mind goes elsewhere. Else when isn't the only term Dan Gilbert of Harvard University has made up to describe how we humans roam in our minds to other times. He also uses the term prospect as meaning the opposite of retrospect. Right now, you can close your eyes and simulate any point in time. You can think about retirement, you can remember being a child. This seems to be the kind of trick that no other animal can do. You know, we're the animal that can learn from mistakes without making them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to uh, chew a mouthful of thumbtacks to know it's a horribly bad idea. Uh, nobody's ever whipped up liver ice cream to see how it tastes. Mm -hmm. Because we can actually simulate these kinds of experiences. This keeps us from making drastic errors that would be very bad for our well-being. Mm -hmm. So this ability to prospect, to think about what might happen, allows us to choose between the futures that are best and the futures that are worst. I'm still fascinated by the fact that deep in my brain are apparently overlapping regions allowing me on the one hand to read others' minds and on the other to travel in time. The question then is, which one of these things or both of them were selected for in evolutionary terms? Mm -hmm. uh, was it very important that I be able to read other people's minds and time travel is just a nice uh, perk that I get out of having this system? Or is it the other way around? Well, how, how come? I don't see why they would necessarily be the yeah, same. Yeah, what's the connection? Yeah. The connection is that both of them require that you escape your present point of view. Uh, for in one case, I'm getting out of my point of view and I'm trying to figure out what your exactly. point of view is. And in the other case, getting out of my present time zone and I'm going into the future to exactly explore so. that. In a sense, your future self is another person whose mind you want oh, to understand. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. So you can move on the time dimension or you can move on the interpersonal dimension, yeah. but it turns out that movement on these two dimensions is accomplished by the same parts of the brain. 
So looking inside my head has revealed intriguing glimpses of the human spark. Between the ability to use tools and language and the ability to cooperate with others, our brains have evolved into something truly unique in the animal world. And literally at the center of our brains and at the center of our humanity is the special insight we have into the minds of our fellow humans, even our future selves. And along with that is the imagination to see how things might be different from the way they are. Insight and imagination, both seem to be right at the heart of the human spark. Insight, not only into the minds of others, but also insight into the unseen forces that make our world work. And imagination to create from what nature gives us a place like this. And not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. And it's insight and imagination that set us apart from our relatives, both living and extinct. While our extinct cousins, the Neanderthals, were still making axes much as their predecessors had for over a million years, our ancestors had the insight to see in a stick and stone and string a powerful weapon and the imagination to devise new ways of hunting. Got it. Look at that. Unlike the Neanderthals, the people who would become us had the insight to see how a stone with a hole could become a bead, and the imagination to see that bead as a symbol for conveying status and forging a sense of community. Although we share much with our living cousins, the chimpanzees, our greater insight into unseen forces like gravity gives us powers beyond the reach of apes while our greater insight into each other's minds takes us beyond pure competition and into the collaborative venture that is teaching. That insight also gives us the ability to cooperate on enterprises, both great and small, that we call civilization. Finally, of course, there's the precious link of language, the uniquely human ability to build from a few sounds an infinite range of meaning so that the insight and imagination of each of us can be shared among all of us. Insight and imagination, two traits that, ironically, are perhaps best expressed when we're apparently doing nothing at all. When our minds are filled with yesterdays and tomorrows, daydreams and wonderings, regrets and hopes. That's the human spark. Imagine that. The Human Spark was made possible by the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. And by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, to enhance public understanding of science and technology and to portray the lives of men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Additional funding was provided by the John Templeton Foundation, supporting science, investing in the big questions. the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, and the Winston Foundation. the search for The Human Spark online. PBS.org has streaming episodes, web-exclusive videos, production blogs, Spark-related news, and your submissions.